and welcome to Module 2. We're going to begin thinking about the process for developing a content strategy. In particular, we're going to focus on planning and project management. This lecture has three parts. I'll start by explaining the overall process of content strategy development. Then I'll describe the planning phase in some detail. And finally, explore project management tools often used by tech comm professionals. All right, so in part one, I said we would think about the process of developing a content strategy for an organization or business. How do businesses create a strategy for transforming the sea of content assets they have created and determining what they will create in the future? as well as how and when to deliver that content in a way that maximizes business value. In December of 2020, I had the pleasure of asking an experienced content strategist that question. Rahel Ann Bailey is Chief Knowledge Officer at Scroll LLP and author of Content Strategy, Connecting the Dots Between Business Brand and Benefits. Let's listen to what she had to say about the process. We are the management consultants of the content world. We don't do financial turnarounds, we do content turnarounds. So the first thing you have to do is use the consulting methodology, which is discovery, gap analysis, roadmap, right? So you do the discovery, which is what is the problem you're trying to solve? What's the business problem you're trying to solve? And once you see the business problem, you work back from there. So you have to interview people. So you interview your users or your proxy users, maybe, you know, and I've done those kinds of things in, um, uh, with my students where we, we pick a small company and, you know, they actually do an interview with, uh, with the stakeholders of the company. And then we start to do the, the basics, right? You, you've got your, what's your current state? What are you doing now? What do you want to be doing? What's preventing you from getting there? And so you do the inventory and the audit and the analysis and you know the quantitative audit and the qualitative analysis and 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 so on as part of that. And then once you get that, then that's where you you do the then you do the analysis of it, right? So it's like oh, they have support calls, too many support calls, or, you know, inconsistency. It tells you to do this over here, but it tells you to do that over here. Why? Because they're copying and pasting, people are updating, they're missing things. Okay, so when that's the problem, then it comes down to one, one of the analyses is we need reuse. We need a single source of truth that we can use in different places, because that's the problem. If that's not the problem, you're not going to get to that answer. And then you can put together the roadmap to say, and that's the final step is the roadmap. How do you, what do you do about it? So you say, you need to A, B, C, D based on this analysis, which is based on this gap analysis, which is based on your discovery. And that's the core for me of content strategy. Everything else is superfluous. Well, it's not superfluous, but it's, uh, you know, there are things that you'll do if it's a technical project. There are things you'll do if it's a complex project. There are things you'll do if there's a governance uh, aspect of it. But the core is discovery, gap analysis, analyzing that, coming to some conclusions, roadmap. Rahel's simple three-phase process is shown on this slide. It's similar to how Sarah O'Keefe, CEO of Scriptorium, describes content strategy as a form of management consulting. But it's not how everyone describes the process. If you've read Nichols' Enterprise Content Strategy book, you know he describes a nine-phase process. Looks like this. Note that Kevin's phases of plan and assess appear to fit within what Rahel calls the discovery phase. His define phase appears to fit within Rahel's gap analysis phase, and his design phase appears to fit within Rahel's roadmap phase. The rest of Kevin's phases weren't discussed by Rahel in our interview, although she talks about them elsewhere. They all deal with implementing the roadmap and governing process for developing a content strategy. I want to briefly mention that Kevin has reduced the number of phases involved in developing a strategy since he published his book. The approach described on his consultancy website, Avenue CX, lists seven 
Again, however, they do appear to coincide with Rahel's three-phase process for developing a strategy. I'm emphasizing that one for two reasons. One is it's simplest. The other is that in TECM 5200, we won't have time to talk in any detail at all about the activities involved in implementation and governance. Instead, we'll focus primarily on what goes into and up to the roadmap. This is a deliberate choice based on the fact that we have an eight-week term, and I want you to be able to dig in deep and learn a great deal about doing content strategy rather than simply reading about it. For now, we'll move on to part two. We'll begin learning about the first stage of discovery, what Kevin calls planning. I hope you watched the brief video I shared on Canvas that animated a popular cartoon called How Projects Really Work. Its humor is based on the most common underlying issue with all projects, regardless of industry, lack of quality communication among the stakeholders. In this way, developing a content strategy is no different than any other project. Much of the planning that's done at the beginning is an attempt to overcome this widespread problem. The first task, therefore, in planning a content strategy development project is to determine who the content stakeholders actually are. In the Module 1 lecture, I told you that in the vast majority of businesses, there's no centralized job role or individual who manages all of a business's content. Rather, it's a content ecosystem made up of many employees within different business units. They and their supervisors probably feel they own those content assets, as they should. At a minimum, those employees and supervisors are stakeholders. The book Enterprise Content Strategy includes a table with 15 different potential business units listed as content stakeholders and possibly members of the content strategy development team. When I spoke to Colleen Jones, CEO of Content Science in December of 2020, she told me about her experience with content strategy within tech companies. Let's listen to her for a minute. You talk a little bit about the, the stakeholders, like who usually comes up with the idea they need to do this and reaches out to you, but then who else needs to be involved? Yeah, so the stakeholders tend to be a mix of what I call business function owners, people who are responsible for marketing. And in a larger company or organization, you might have different types of marketing that they're responsible for. Uh, people are responsible for customer success or support or customer experience, uh, where product documentation, support documentation is absolutely critical. That kind of content is also important in marketing and sales too. Um, but those uh, stakeholders tend to own that function. So a director of customer success or director of customer experience. Um, so you've got the business function stakeholders. Then you have subject matter expert stakeholders. And those are the people who know the technology. They know the product. They know the topic. They know the context, you know, the market or global region or what have you. And they need to be involved to help ensure that content that you're planning for, um, you know, is accurate. It's on target. It's um, updated, current. So those kinds of stakeholders are um, engineers or engineering leaders, product managers, or program managers, uh, the types of people who are really making sure all the I's are dotted and, and T's are crossed and really have the in-depth knowledge. The business function stakeholders are more responsible for hitting goals, business goals, hitting business numbers, uh, responsible for making sure teams are running smoothly, operations are running smoothly, uh, things like that. So two very different categories of stakeholders, but they always come into play with content strategy. 
Once you've determined which stakeholders are involved and how they'll be represented on the core content strategy project team, your task is to collect as much information as possible about content requirements. Enterprise Content Strategy, the book, provides a laundry list of possibilities. For example, the team should have copies of content standards like branding guides, style guides, voice guides, and so on. They should have information about content or editorial calendars. They should know about existing user personas or customer journey maps. They should know about publication processes or workflows. And they should have access to existing business objectives and metrics or KPIs, key performance indicators used to measure content performance. More about them later. Some organizations will have much existing requirements information and others will not. The important point is that the project team should start with all the relevant information about content that already exists. To summarize what Nichols says in his book about gathering requirements during the planning phase, first, the project team needs to gather requirements in order to determine the objectives in developing a content strategy in the first place. Second, they need to know what technology can and cannot be used to implement a new content strategy. Third, they need to understand the requirements for publishing content, and this is important, in each of the different business units that create content. Let's listen to what Val Swisher, CEO of Content Rules, told me about gathering information from stakeholders at this stage of a project when I spoke to her in December of 2020. So when I do this kind of work, there are two different kinds of interviews that I conduct. And sometimes the same person will be in, uh, sometimes I have the same <laughs> person for, for both interviews and I can ask them all the questions at once. The first are the business goals. And usually to understand the business goals, um, you need to talk to management. And it may be the case that you would be best off talking to the person above the writing manager. It might be that case to really find out what is their vision as a director or whatever they are. What's their business goal? What are their KPIs? What have they been told they must do? I also talk to people that are under that management that's under that and uh, about the business goals. I ask questions like, what does success on this strategy project look like to you? In two years, if we look back, how will we know if we're successful, right? Because content strategy can be somewhat squishy sometimes. It can be very concrete in certain ways, but really squishy sometimes. The second kind of interview is with the practitioners, the people who actually do the work. And I try to get everyone who is involved in the creation and publishing of the content. Writers, subject matter experts, reviewers, editors, um, localization people, whoever has a piece of the puzzle. And what I'm trying to find out from them are a few things. First of all, how do you do your job today? Tell me, tell me more, tell me your workflow. Tell me about your process and tell me where it hurts. What's not working for you? What is working for you? You know, but what's not working for you? Let me go back to the other, just dawned on me. For the other management interviews, I also ask about um, what, you know, what's working, what's not, but okay. so I ask, what are, what are the strengths of your team? What are the weaknesses of your team? What do you see as opportunities and what do you see as threats? So it's good to know that at the management level. I think it's worth emphasizing that in order to gather these requirements, team members need to ask stakeholders good questions. For example, what do you want is less likely to provide useful information than what would count as success. Team members also need to listen carefully to what stakeholders have to offer. 
Content strategist Christina Halverson says listening is the content strategist's most important job. If you've never actually practiced active listening, you'll be surprised how exhausting it is. Deciding the speaker has an idea that won't work while they're speaking is not active listening. Instead, you have to work at deferring judgment. At the end of the planning phase, you should have a team who knows what they're trying to accomplish when developing a content strategy. They've talked to stakeholders and listened carefully. Team members need to know their schedule and budget for the project. They should also know how they're going to make decisions along the way, and they need to know who's responsible for different deliverables like providing weekly status updates or compiling a content inventory. In the business world, these ideas are written into something called a project charter. Nichols provides an overview of the information included in a typical charter in Chapter 2 on plan phase. If you've taken any other TECM courses, you should be familiar with team charters. Project charters are similar, but are focused on goals and tasks rather than people. should be obvious that developing a content strategy is a complex activity that's somewhat unique every time. That means it's best tackled with some knowledge of project management tools and techniques. That's where we're headed in part three of this lecture. The graphic displays the primary difference between an agile method in green on the left in which many sprints of short time periods result in constant software feature releases, right? And then on the red or orange on the right, a waterfall method in which one entire phase of a development must be complete before another one can begin. There are fewer and less frequent feature releases. The finer details are truly not important in this course. What's important is that you've heard the terms Agile and Waterfall and can locate information about them in the future. Also, that you recognize why methods for managing projects like developing a content strategy are used. I'm going to cover in the next few slides those concepts that are most important for the purposes of our course. All businesses whose work is project-based adopt software tools to make managing projects more successful. Mostly these tools support either agile or waterfall project management, but some are more specific. In software firms, it's common to use something called JIRA to track bugs or other issues in software code while it's being developed. The company who created JIRA also created a tool you can use for free called Trello. Another freemium tool is Rike. There's also Monday.com for enterprises. Some additional tools include the free ones, Asana and Freedcamp. Many tech workplaces use Slack, which is also a freemium tool for project team communication. Microsoft has sold a tool called Project for a long time. Many enterprises today are using Teams, which combines project management, communication, and content management into a single tool. In fact, you can use a tool like Trello from inside Teams. It's also important that you know what WBS, which stands for Work Breakdown Structure, is all about and why it's useful. It's a common project management technique for use primarily within a waterfall method where every deliverable is known at the beginning of a project. So let me show you with a, an example here. This spreadsheet lists project deliverables, things like a project charter, info gathering, white paper creation. The deliverable info gathering is decomposed into a hierarchy of tasks which make up one work package or Maybe you could call it a milestone in the project. Each individual task includes start and end dates, expected duration, and the individual who owns that task. For large, complex projects with many team members, a WBS can be incredibly valuable as a management technique. It obviously requires a lot of time upfront planning. You should also know what a Kanban board is. It's another technique, and it's more commonly used with Agile methods. In the simple example shown in this photo, there are three columns, or what are called swim lanes, drawn on a whiteboard. They designate the status of tasks. Each task appears on an individual sticky note and is put on the board in a swim lane. 
The owner of the task updates the board by moving the sticky note to a different swim lane. So anybody who looks at the board can see a task current status. Kanban boards can be used in what are often called daily stand-ups, where team members gather for just a few minutes at the beginning of each workday to discuss the project and provide updates. I'll have more to say about status updates in just a minute. Let's look at a specific but simple example of how project management tools and techniques can work together. The example is in Trello and shows how to manage a simple project. This is making Billy's Italian cream cake with blueberries. With Trello, you create a card for each task. You're seeing all the details for one card in the middle of this slide. There's a card title and description. You can also assign labels, due dates, and you can provide pretty detailed instructions that you can click as you finish to keep track of progress for that card. On this slide, you see the entire Trello board with each of its 10 cards minimized let me show you how you might use Trello along with WBS. Each swim lane in the example on this slide represents a deliverable along the way to the end of the project, which is the cake. There's a resource list. There's prepare batter, create cake, prepare frosting, and finally decorate. Each card in the swim lane represents a separate task like the one you saw on the previous slide. Those cards with dates in green are complete. The one in red is overdue. The example on this slide shows you how to use Trello as a true Kanban board. Each swim lane here represents a task status. Backlog is the to-do list. There's currently doing, done, and a parking lot, which is for problems or issues. Again, each card in the swim lane represents a separate task with details when you click on them and expand the card. The colors show which ones are completed on time, overdue. And although I haven't used Microsoft Teams much in this way, the planner, which I believe has now been renamed as Tasks, appears to be capable of handling both WBS and Kanban type project information much the same way that Trello does. One purpose for using project management tools like Trello or Kanban boards is to allow everyone on your team to check the board to see the status of tasks that other people are working on. There are many stakeholders who have an interest in any business project. There'll be sometimes remote team members, there'll be managers, clients, etc. Even with an online Kanban board, it's common for teams to meet synchronously every workday. In tech, status meetings have included some remote members for many years now. Managers or other stakeholders might have access to a project team's board, but it's still common to have maybe weekly synchronous meetings on project status. Clients also get status updates, but these would occur less frequently and perhaps coincide with a major project milestone. The more meeting attendees know about what's happening in a project, the shorter the status meeting. So status meetings among just team members are typically very short. Those that include a manager or supervisor a little longer, those with a client would be the longest. Some of the most important reasons that the team and stakeholders meet about project status has to do with maintaining trust. Also, keeping up with fast changing details and revealing issues or obstacles earlier rather than later. And finally, getting resources or help as soon as possible. I hope you watched the video of a team meeting linked in the instructional materials for Module 2. In just a couple of minutes, it gives you an excellent overview of how a daily team stand-up is used in the software industry. The team in the video was working on the Sous Chef app, a collaboration between IBM Watson and the magazine Bon Appetit. Each team member provided just three pieces of info. What have they done since yesterday, or whenever the team held the last stand-up? What do they plan to do today? And what main issue or obstacle do they have? People stand in order to encourage people to be quick about giving the information and getting back to work. If the sous chef team leader had a status meeting later that week with his IBM manager, he probably would share similar information. However, he'd probably begin with what's called a RAG. It stands for red, amber, green, the colors of a traffic light. The team leader would begin with a statement like, sous chef development is currently amber, 
as long as we get our speech recognition expert from Tokyo to Boston by the beginning of next week, I anticipate returning to green status. So he begins with the color because his manager has told him that anytime the schedule is going to be pushed back one week, he expects to hear the status as amber. It's critical to the team leader to give this information first. No one in management likes surprises. It's the manager's job to solve issues and remove obstacles so that a project is completed on time and on budget. In that status meeting with the manager, the team leader would also talk about progress against milestones and any issues or obstacles. I shared another video link in the instructional materials that offers a brief tutorial on creating a RAG report. At this point, you should understand a little bit about methods and tools for managing projects like content strategy development. Nearly every tech comm professional does project-based work, so practicing some techniques and using some tools now will continue to pay off for you into the future, not only when planning a content strategy development project. <music>